Okay, let's next continue. Let's continue our lipids and the lipoprotein lectures. So here we are going to talk about the next class of lipids. They are called glycerophospholipids. So which means they got a glycerol group plus phosphate group and it's a lipid molecules. They are commonly called as phospholipids or phosphoglycerides. Most of the time it's called as phospholipids and they form our phospholipid cell membrane. So as I mentioned before in the previous video, our cell membrane is made up of phospholipid bilayer. OK, so it's a two layers of phospholipids. So these lipids are the predominant component to make our cell membranes. So basically this one is contained. This lipid contains a phosphate head group plus two fatty acid molecules. So it's pretty much similar to triacylglycerol because it's got a glycerol and two fatty acid molecules. So only thing instead of the next, the last third fatty acid molecule, it's the alcohol group is reacting with the phosphate group and then the phosphate group is basically reacting with another alcohol group here. OK, so the X group. So I'll come to this X group in a minute. So it's similar to TAG but it's not exactly tag because it's got only two fatty acids and the last alcohol group is reacting with the phosphate group and the phosphate group is reacting with another I mean uh, alcohol. So basically this is amphiphilic in nature and that's why they are in plasma membrane. So it's got a non-polar tail. So the fatty acids are non-polar or water insoluble in nature and then it's got a polar head because of the phosphate group and this alcohol group. OK, so if you look at the plasma membrane, the polar heads will be on the surface of the membrane or inside of the cell, but the non-polar tails will be the core of the membrane. So inside the membrane, you will see the non-polar uh, tails. So the heads will be on the surface and inside of the cells. So the X group can be different X groups. For example, if it is a water molecule in the X group, then it's called phosphatidic acid. If it is ethanolamine in the X group, then it's called phosphatidyl ethanolamine. If it's choline, it's called phosphatidyl choline. So the names will change based on the X group here. So it could be any of these X groups attached here. And all these names will change based on the X group, but they are all important for cell membranes, but it could be for different cell type membranes. OK, so generally phospholipids are made up of glycerol, two fatty acids, one phosphate group, and that phosphate group will react with another alcohol group. OK, and they are predominantly important to make our cell membranes. And based on the type of this X group, the alcohol group, the name of phospholipid will change and their functions and the component in the main cell type cell structures will also change. OK, so the next type of lipids are called sphingolipids. So sphingolipids are also major membrane components and they are derivatives of C18 amino alcohols such as sphingosin and dihydrosphingosin. So these are two carbon 18 containing carbon 18 containing amino alcohols. So these molecules will react with the fatty acid and form another molecule called ceramide. OK, so the core part of these molecules, these sphingolipids are the sphingosin and dihydrosphingosin and they will react with NS1 fatty acid derivatives and it will make a component called ceramide. OK, so they basically the derivatives of the fatty acid derivatives of the C18 amino alcohols are called as ceramide. The ceramide will act as a parent compound for any type of sphingolipid. You can take any type of sphingolipid and each sphingolipid will have the ceramide as a functional or parental unit. So what is ceramide? So the ceramide, ceramide is basically an amino alcohol which is either sphingosin or dihydrosphingosin plus fatty acid molecule. Yeah, please don't get confused here. A yeah, fatty acid molecule and sphingosin or dihydrosphingosin makes ceramide and this ceramide acts as a parent compound for all sphingolipids. So most abundant sphingolipids in our body are sphingomyelins, cerebrocytes and gangliosides. OK, what are sphingomyelins? So the sphingomyelin is basically ceramide plus phosphocholine or phosphoethanolamine. So that's what is making the sphingomyelin. You can see here. So you got the ceramide unit because that's a parent unit. It's going to be there. Plus it's got phosphocholine or phosphoethanolamine. So that's what is forming sphingomyelins. So myelin sheath 
is rich in sphingomyelin. OK, now in our body, if you look at the myelin sheath, it's got a huge amount of sphingomyelins. So what myelin sheath is doing in our body? So myelin sheath is basically surrounds and electrically insulate many of our nerve cells. OK, so it's basically insulation around our nerve cells and the insulation is made up of sphingomyelins and the sphingomyelin is made up of ceramide. Ceramide contains fatty acid plus amino alcohol. So try to simplify and understand this easily, please. OK, the next type of sphingolipids are cerebrosides. OK, they are also called glycosphingolipids. OK, they are also called as glycosphingolipids. So what does it mean basically? So it's got a ceramide base component. So here you can see it's got a ceramide as base component plus it's got a sugar residue. OK, in the other one, it had a phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylethanolamine, then it's forming sphingomyelin. But here you got ceramide group plus you got a sugar molecule. OK, so based on the sugar molecule, the name will change. For example, if it's a galactose cerebrosides, this will be this sugar molecule will be galactose. If it is glucose cerebrosides, this will be a glucose molecule, but the ceramide component will stay the same. So galactose cerebrosides are mostly prevalent in neuronal cell membrane in brain, obviously, and the glucose cerebrosides are in membranes of other tissues. OK, so they are called cerebrosides which is basically ceramide component plus only one sugar residue that could be galactose or glucose. So the last class of sphingolipids are gangliosides. OK, so this is quite complex sphingolipids, uh, so you can quickly look at the structure here. It's a really complex structure. So how this is made up of? So it's basically it's got a ceramide unit. You can see here ceramide unit. Here the fatty acid is steric acid plus oligosaccharides. So plus it's got several sugar residues. In cerebrosides, it's only one sugar residue, but here it's got few residues. So that's why it's called oligosaccharides. It means a few sugar residues. Plus, it will have at least one molecule of sialic acid, which is basically N acetyl neuraminic acid. It's also known as sialic acid. So, what is ganglioside? It's ceramide unit plus few sugar molecules or oligosaccharides plus definitely at least one sialic acid residue. That's what is called as sphing ganglioside. OK, so they are the primary components of cell surface membranes and they constitute around 6% on the brain lipids. OK, it's really important. That's why it's called the ganglions, gangliosides. They are really important in brain and they act as receptors for hormones and several toxins molecules. And based on the number of the N acetyl neuraminic acid or sialic acid molecules present in the gangliosides, the classifications will vary like one nano, one, uh, two nano and two, three nano and four nano and based on the number of sugar molecules as well within each class that the classification will vary. So what are gangliosides? It's a complex sphingolipids. OK, they are mainly predominantly present in brain membranes. And this is made up of ceramide plus oligosaccharides, which means few sugar residues and plus at least one sialic acid. If the sialic acid is not there, then this can't be formed. And based on the number of sialic acids present and the number of sugar molecules, the classification of these gangliosides will change. OK, the next class of lipids or steroids. OK, so steroids are our last class of lipids. So steroids basically don't have any fatty acids. Instead, they will have a carbon and a hydrogen rings. So you can see the structure of cholesterol here. It doesn't have any fatty acid, even though it can get esterified with the fatty acid through this alcohol group in the third carbon position. But it's mostly made up of the carbon hydrogen rings. OK, so mostly they function as a hormones or signaling molecules. For example, cholesterol, estrogen and testosterone. These are all important hormones and cholesterol is acting as a precursor for most of the hormones. So cholesterol, as I said, it's a precursor for most of the steroid hormones. So it's got a weak polar group. That's because of this hydroxyl group and the third carbon position. OK, at the third carbon position, it's got a hydroxyl group. That's why it's got weak polar in nature, so they can be slightly water soluble, but 
it's got a fused ring system and this fused ring system will provide a greater rigidity okay because of the ring system it's got a huge rigidity it is an important determinant in cell membrane if you look at the plasma membrane these cholesterol molecules will be anchored everywhere okay it's really an integral part of plasma membrane so because these molecules provide that rigidity for plasma membrane it prevents the solidification of our plasma membrane in cold temperature and movement or wobbliness during warm temperature because plasma membrane is made up of lipids phospholipids we just talked about that so these cholesterol molecules are providing some form of rigidity for the plasma membrane therefore it can prevent the solidification and the movement when the temperature changes nearly 70% of cholesterol in our body or esterified with fatty acids so the third carbon position will react with the fatty acid molecule and therefore it can make a ester linkage again the carboxyl group of fatty acid will react with the hydroxyl group of this cholesterol and make a cholesterol esters in plasma and that's how they will circulate in the body so plants do have stigma sterol and beta cis cytosterol so they differ in the aliphatic chiasside chain just down here so the animals particularly humans contain cholesterol and this cholesterol are important molecules because they are acting as precursors for steroid hormones and vitamin D and they form integral part in plasma membranes okay so these are the five different classes about lipids and we gone through all basic and essential information about these lipids so make sure you understand all these critical points and try to remember them for your final exam and for your future lectures on cardiovascular diseases next year as well okay so now we are moving on to lipoproteins so what are lipoproteins so the name itself suggesting that it's got a lipid component plus protein component okay so both lipids and the proteins non covalently associated in order to make lipoproteins so these lipoproteins are acting as a cargo vehicles okay like trucks you will see in motorways all the time so these cargo vehicles are really important to transport the triacylglycerols and the cholesterol across the body because the body cells every single cell needs triacylglycerol and cholesterol so in order to transport we need cargo vehicles and that's where these lipoproteins comes in as cargo vehicles so the main job of lipoproteins is to transport these molecules triacylglycerols and the cholesterols so lipoproteins are broadly classified into five classes okay so and we are going to talk about each class so based on that size they are mainly named okay for example the large ones nearly 1 micron in size they are called chylomicrons so these chylomicrons that type of lipoproteins they will contain around 99% lipids and around 1% fat uh, sorry 1% protein so it's got 99% lipids and 1% proteins these are the largest lipoproteins present in our body they are called chylo microns so micron means it's around 1 micron in size and they will be transported through chyle in the lymphatic system which we will talk about that in a minute so that's why they are called chylomicrons so the chylomicrons basically transport exogenous triacylglycerols and cholesterol from intestine to tissues so when we eat food for example fat food it could be any animal fat or tissues or oil so when you eat it it will get digested in the gut and it will be absorbed so this has to be transported to the tissues and finally to the liver so that's what these chylomicrons are doing it's basically taking exogenous triacylglycerol and cholesterol from intestine and supply to the tissues so that's its main role so what are the next ones so the next we got very low density lipoproteins okay the density is coming down now come at compared to your chylomicrons because they are highly dense molecule and big molecules so the next ones are very low density lipoproteins so they contain around 92% lipids and 8% proteins the next one is intermediate density lipoproteins they contain around 85% lipids and 15% proteins and then the next one is low density lipoproteins they contain around 80% lipids and around 20% proteins 
So what are the roles of these molecules? Basically, they are all low density lipoproteins, but in different size with a different amount of tag and the cholesterol. So they transport endogenous triacylglycerol and cholesterol from liver to the tissues. OK, liver produces tag uh, from excess carbohydrates. OK, it's really important to meet the body's demand. So the body needs a certain amount of fat, particularly tag and cholesterol every day. So we can't take everything through our diet and therefore liver is taking over this job and producing whatever the quantity is required in order to meet the body demands. So the liver is producing all of this and packaging into VLDL and that will get into plasma and start to supply the materials and then slowly becoming smaller in their size which we'll talk about that in a minute. So the next type of lipoproteins are high density lipoproteins. OK, they are the smallest type of lipoproteins. You need to remember that the smallest type of lipoproteins are HDLs or high density lipoproteins and the largest ones are chylomicrons. So the HDLs will contain 50% of lipid, 50% of proteins. OK, and what is the role of HDL? So in contrast to all these molecules, HDL will be transporting endogenous cholesterol from tissues to the liver. OK, so all the other molecules are supplying fat to the tissues all over the body, but the HDL will be collecting the excess amount of cholesterol from the tissues and take it to the liver in order to get metabolized because the excess amount of uh, cholesterol in the tissues is not good. It can lead to cardiovascular diseases. So that's why generally people will call HDL as good cholesterol, which means it's collecting all the cholesterol from the tissues and taking it to liver and then the LDL as bad cholesterol. But scientifically, we wouldn't really agree with these terms, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol because they are all same cholesterol. OK, it's just these lipoproteins doing different functions. LDL is supplying uh, tissues with this uh, tag and cholesterol, but HDL is collecting the excess amount of cholesterol and taking it to the liver. So these are the five different classes of lipoproteins. Chylomicrons, VLDL, IDL, LDL and HDL. Chylomicrons basically transporting exogenous tag and cholesterol from our food, mainly from intestine to the tissues and VLDL, IDL, LDL will transport endogenous tag and cholesterol from liver to the tissues. HDL will transport endogenous cholesterol from tissues to the liver. OK, so the lipoprotein structure. So how do the structure will look like? So the lipoproteins are like a small visa like structure. They will pretty much look like a cell, but it's not actually a cell. It's just like a cargo vehicle. So it will look like visa like structure. So it will have a non-polar core inside. So that's where all the tag triazylglycerols and cholesterol esters because they are non-polar in nature. So triazylglycerols completely neutralized all the polar groups. Similarly, cholesterol esters, the hydroxyl group at the third carbon of cholesterol is esterified with the fatty acid. So they are non-polar in nature. So all these molecules, the triglycerides and the esterified cholesterol will get packed inside the lipoproteins. OK, and then the outer surface of the lipoproteins. This is where it looks like similar to plasma membrane, but it's not exactly plasma membrane. So they will have amphiphilic surface because they got proteins, upper proteins, OK, upper lipoproteins or upper proteins, and they are water soluble. So they have polar in nature and they do have a phospholipids. And as we've seen before, phospholipids will have phosphoric Head, phosphate, sorry, polar head because of the phosphate group, and then it's got a free cholesterol, which has got the hydroxyl group at the third carbon position. So the surface will be amphiphilic in surface, okay, and the but core will be non-polar in nature. So there are different types of upper proteins here, and the different upper proteins are produced in different uh, uh, body parts. For example, some will be produced in intestine. For example, upper B. 48, but upper B100, that's another important one, will be produced in the liver. 
Okay, so lipoprotein from intestine is secreted into lymph, which we'll talk about that in detail in a minute. And the lipoprotein from liver will be secreted into plasma. And the upper proteins, E, C2, and C3 may also come from HDL during the recycling of the HDL. So here is a table with all different types of lipoproteins and their major characteristics and their sizes, which you can look through in detail. So I will stop this video here. In the next one, we will look at the lipoproteins function in more detail. Thank you.